So we have happy things. Thank you. Amen. For those who have the handouts, we're just going to touch on something that's mentioned in the handout that we spoke about last week. And page 178. Before we look at the handout, though, I want to ask a question. Say the word masculine and feminine. And if I have to ask you to come with your mind, with, so is, there, is there, other than a physical difference, is there an inherent difference between masculine and feminine? Everyone close their eyes, please. And only I'm going to have my eyes open, but everyone else is going to close their eyes. Who thinks there is an inherent difference between masculine and feminine? Raise your hands now. Okay, hands down. Who thinks there's no inherent difference between masculine and feminine? Everyone close their eyes, please. No inherent difference, please raise your hand. Okay, everyone put your hands down. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so what happened? What do you mean by Look at the screen. What do you mean by inherent difference? Uh, he's a, he's English English. Writer. Okay. The, uh, so first of all, inherent. Inherent. That means inherent in the way they are almost in their nature, mm-hmm. right? But it could be also nurture. That there's a difference that inherent in, in, in what we say. Can we say there are characteristics that are masculine and characteristics that are feminine? Can we make that kind of a broad statement. Well, in the room, overwhelmingly, there was um, there was. Everyone most agreed that there was uh, there is a difference, there is an inherent difference, and now I'm going to ask us to think about everyone together. Think about masculine characteristics. Okay, we'll give about thirty seconds, uh, twenty seconds to think. Then I'm going to ask you to get uh, some answers. Masculine characteristics, and I'll write it down. That would be very dangerous and very general. <laughs> Fred is not even here. I know it's not X and Y clothes. No, no, no. We'll go with you, okay? We'll go with you. 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 we And everyone with their finger on the tablecloth or somewhere on the palm, write down, please, two characteristics that you thought. Write them down. Is there anyone that needs more time to think of the differences? Or a character, male, masculine characteristics? Anyone think? Yeah, I only have one. One is okay. One is good. Okay. Everyone have one? At least? Okay, we're going to go around the room. Say the first one on the list. Uh, linear in thinking. Decisive. Okay. He's a masculine, right? Let's see, if the same one say the yeah. same one. Same one? They can't have the same so one. Why no comment? No comment, no comment. He took mine. Um, say it, so say it. It's okay. No, I was saying very, uh, one can do one thing at one time. Michael said linear. Not a multi Uh, character. Aggressive. Mark? Mathematical. Michael. Valor? Warrior and protector. Okay. 
Okay. okay. <laughs> Can I know your name? Okay. What's your name? Dina. Dina? Oh, Dina. Dina. Ah, okay. Jamie? <laughs> I was thinking of a woman one. Hold on, let me get the other oh. one. Okay, sorry. Hey, Mimi. Nick? Your name, I forgot. Alvin. Rational? I had a aggressive, but that could be assertive. Aggressive and assertive is my second one. Okay. And logical. Logical. Math. Testosterone levels are high. I uh, I wrote, I had rational. Okay. Um, feminine or female character. Twenty seconds. And then. Uh, <laughs> could, you, could you logically decide why right you do male first or female first? I thought about it. I said that people would be uh, comfortable with that. Uh, I don't know what I have a distraction. Okay, but just curious. It would, I mean, I'll I'll talk about the method in a minute. Okay. Just uh, twenty seconds. Take some time. To think about uh, female characteristics, list it to, write it on your hand on the table. Just make sure you can read your writing <laughs> with, with your finger, obviously. And uh, go ahead. Right down, right. We did male characteristics. Now we're doing female characteristics. Oh. Going around the table. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we'll go first. No, we're we'll gonna start around <laughs> this side now. Right. Uh, does, does everyone, anyone need more time? I want to write down at least one. Okay, good. Yeah. Caring. Caring. But emotional. Emotional. Nurturing. Nurture. Giving. Giving. Elliot? I nurture. Nurturing. Maybe. Intuitive. Intuitive. Mm. Um, I was going to say, like, hormonal, sensitive, like, sensitive. Uh, Emotional. Uh, Dina? I was going to say nurturing. Nurturing? Okay. What's the name? Eric. Eric. Eric? Female character? Yeah. Magnificent. Yeah. Magnificent. Interesting. Uh, this is definitely not PC, you know, generalizations, and, 
And we're just trying to get a general sense of male and female characteristics. Because we're going to see, and it doesn't mean that all men have these and all women no. have these, and think, but if you had to just say, when we think of these terms, we, use the, 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 we think of something. And these are the things that I want. To, we're going to now reach some words that will seem unusual to us. And we're going to talk about a feminine style of Torah learning. It's strange. When I first heard the word, it sounded strange to me. What's a feminine style? You know, is it better than my style? You know, <laughs> ready in the you know competitive kind of <laughs> thinking. And and what Rav Shagar is going to we're going to read a little bit of Rav Shagar today. That she wouldn't be a show doesn't work on Rav Shalom. But we're going to look at the basis of this type of thinking, and we're going to apply it in several areas in our life, in community life, in our family life. And, uh, and we're going to study today, we're going to ex- examine the basis of what is a feminine style of learning the Torah. Okay? Ready? Yeah. Please look at the handout on page 178. is a paragraph that begins Mikol Makom <coughs> Mikol Makom in any event Chevrat Ha'atid Shel Ha'geula Tiyer Chevrat Raka in any event the, the future the future society of the redemption the future redeemed society will be a soft a soft society not a rigid hard society a society, a society whose whose values, whose virtues will be modesty, hashiflut uh, v'harakut, self self sacrifice and softness, pasiviyut um, tucha, an open minded passivity, hanichonali klot that is ready to receive. And not a society that is full of domination and domineering and uh, success driven, achievement driven. The Kitsur, in short, is going to be a feminine society. So he's kind of predicting where society is headed. And remember, the article is talking about the connection between postmodern, the postmodern age that we live in, and we spoke a little bit about what that is, and certain new movements that are coming up in Israel, with uh, that are becoming more, are more spiritual, and more, uh, almost let's say, looking for a, con- a deeper connection with Hashem. And we spoke about it, even the possibility of uh, the rekindling of prophecy. So here he speaks about the future of society being a more feminine society. <laughs> Wait, before going on to the next thing, what are the what are the characteristics that he ascribes to feminine, a feminine society? That its values are humility, modesty. That is it's um, self sacrifice or shiflut or self effacement, rakut softness, an open passivity and, and a willingness to accept receive, and not a domineering, dominating, achievement-driven society. So he's giving his list, and some of the things coincide with our list. He's coming from, Rav Shagat is coming from an understanding that's based on the Lubavitch Rebbe, Arav Benachem Mendel Schneerson, Zatzal, we'll just call him the Rebbe. Uh, uh, the Rebbe. Mm-hmm. the Rebbe. Okay, we'll call him the Rebbe for now. And where, uh, and who, who, 
Rav Schneerson, the Rebbe's basis was uh, something in the Zohar, in the works of uh, the Ali. So we're going to have to go back now and understand what he says. What is a woman's society? What is a woman learning Torah? And uh, now we can go forward. So it's humility, uh, modesty, uh, softness, an openness to receive and to hear, and, uh, and not a dominating and achievement-driven society. We can imagine such a society. Now continuing, Zeo Mubana Sukim, Abedabrim, Al Kafshida, Tidlavo, Ye, Ora Levana, Kora Shama. This is the understanding of the Sukim that Pasuk and Yeshara says, in the future, the light of the, su- of the moon will be like the light of the sun. The light of the moon will be like the light of the sun. Ukshinekevat, the Sobev Gavir. This is a Pasuk from Yeriya, but it's describing that the future will say, in the future, the woman will court the man, or to sovev, to will surround the man. Okay, what exactly the yeah means, we'll get into in a minute. Bedome le signon shevo piresh admor acharon mechabad et hafaat feminism. In the same way that the last um, Rebbe of Chabad explained feminism in El Chabad. Also, kach kama datziut shal geulat not yet datziut agresivi. Also, religion, a religiosity of the redeemed time, of the Geula, won't be an aggressive religion, religiosity. What does that mean, an aggressive religiosity? We'll come back to that in a second. Well, can we assume he's talking to Dad? Oh, 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 Judaism? Oh, 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 Judaism, yes. She's not talking about Islam. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. But in Judaism. Merkava Hashkina. That the main part of the religiosity of the future or the datiyut, the connection to will be the shechina, shehid dmut nashi, that in Kabbalistic understanding, the shechina is a feminine aspect of Hashem. I know these are, like, what is a feminine aspect of Hashem? In, 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 in the maternal, the maternal. And it also, there's, it also, by the way, there's one time in the Tanakh where God is referred to as a woman. Mm-hmm. Why? No, I said when. When? I never heard of it. Okay. Like a person whose mother comforts him, Hashem, our God, will comfort him. Why is that? Like a mother, like a parallel to a mother, to a woman. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's... Yeah. No, I feel like Hashem doesn't have any gender, like he's not referred to in, in, even in the whole Torah, not gender. Like there was never, I mean, it was always in a masculine term, Hashem yeah. is always referred to in a masculine term, but, and one of the, that's why we always think of it in a masculine term, it's not really, and it's not always something specific that's what I'm talking about. Right. So, of course, we say that Hashem doesn't have a gender, and it's not male, not female, but the, uh, usually in the Tanakh, the images, and metaphors that are used are masculine yeah. and uh, metaphors. There's one case, and I know that this case is a, it's a feminine, or it's used as a, it's compared to a mother, a compassionate, consoling mother, which is, that's, that's great, right? So it means that it doesn't, it's, it's, it's either or both. Um, it, when we move over to Kabbalah, in the Kabbalah, Kabbalistic realm, and Hasidut is very much based on Kabbalah. It's like popularized Kabbalah. So there's a feminine aspect of Hashem, and that's called the Shechina, and that we're going to talk a little bit about. So let's, yeah. yeah, isn't it like the prayers are written, like with Avinu Shabbat Shamayim, like it's talking, the little rules for prayer books are talking in the mass, but that's not what God intended, maybe. He didn't write the prayer books. I'm saying the Tanakh is, is more of what God's writing. So how many examples of the Tanakh that are masculine, 
It's usually masculine. Hi. Usually. Except the one place I, that's the one place I know, I gave it the feminine one. Mm-hmm. But it's usually masculine. Now what? Hard for us to really to think in these terms. So before getting to Hashem's gender and uh, that, which is, I just wanted to bring it out because it's, it's in the Kabbalistic literature and it's part of Hasidut, part of what uh, that Shagat is working with. You have to realize we're talking about symbolic language. And uh, any language, when we're talking about Hashem, is going to fall short. It's going to be something that we are groping. So here, um, when if we had to um, speak about the names of Hashem, this is another name of Hashem, Elohim or Yudke Vavke. So those are two aspects, even already in the Gemara, they speak about two aspects of Din and Rachamim. Right? They speak, think about judgment. Right, which is Elohim, and the Hamim, which is Yudke Vavke. Um, and these two aspects of Hashem, how could Hashem have aspects and things, but there are, there are these, this type of thinking. So we'll take it a step further, they speak about the Shekhinah as being the feminine aspect of Hashem. Uh, the Shekhinah meaning the divine presence, which is more around, more felt, more, if you have to say, imminent or transcendent. Right? So you have, let's say, the Rambam, kind of God, conception of God, very transcendent, very beyond, very almost inaccessible, yeah. uh, very removed, aloof, as opposed to a Hasidic understanding of God, which is much more present, much more imminent. Uh, did anyone go to last week? I, I was in the, the hospital last week on Thursday night with my father. Did anyone go to see Ushpizin by... Yeah. by uh, by Dell and Jeff. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so they, you see the kind of imminent God that they that they are. Why the last speaker wasn't present? Just like the speaker part. Okay. Okay. Uh, so now we have the Rav Shagar says that the Torah of your future and the future of the Jeff of the future will be a non-aggressive. Not aggressive religiosity. Uh, can anyone think of what that means? An aggressive religiosity versus a non aggressive one? But when you hear these terms and you meant something, what, what do you think of? An aggressive religiosity. Non judgmental, maybe? Like, judgmental. So, a non judgmental religion. Non aggressive, also. Okay, a non aggressive is non judgmental. An aggressive is judgmental. I like that one. You like that one? Okay, really? No, because because yeah. you, like you want to push, you really when they're aggressive, you want to push your ideas on somebody else. Okay, so an aggressive one is going to you want to make converts. You want to get more people thinking like you. Constitutive. Eric, you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to say non non imposing. Non imposing. Okay. Not punishing. Same thing. Not punishing. The rabbi will let you finish that the uh, your prayers before he hits you for a donation. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. On a subjective level, it could be fanatical or extremist. In other words, it, could be, it could be objective as vis-a-vis you aggressive on another person, or it be aggressive on one side. From another week. So not, not pushing yourself more and more. Um, so aggressive on oneself would be that you're, you're pushing to a more uh, zealous kind of... Uh, fanatic is a, a judgmental term, I want to keep away from that. But a more zealous kind of, of um, a more exacting kind of, of ever ever increasing exactness in, in what you're doing. Fun, okay, fanatic. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Aggressive. Not so. Okay. Could be less less tolerant. Also, yeah, just going from the opposing figure of the of the openness. And the, the, pass, the, the passive openness that you mentioned, um, open to things rather than um, having having a tunnel vision or a, a focus that doesn't allow uh, for flexibility or okay, uh, more tolerant, uh, allowing for flexibility is less aggressive, and aggressive is is one right way. And I, I happen to have it. My <laughs> 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 okay. uh, 
So non-aggressive or inclusionary. Aggressive or exclusionary. Um, if you have to use the terms the way we talked about them last week, modern and postmodern, you want to take a aggressive and uh, modern. Aggressive is modern. And non-aggressive postmodern. Remember we spoke about modernity was the view that there's truth, there's a single truth, and we're striving for that truth. In the postmodern world, which we live in now, there's multiple worlds, and there's multiple truths, and there's narratives, and there's different ways of looking at things. So aggressive would be a more modernistic view, and a postmodern would be the type of world we're getting into. Okay, let's let's. Um, Can I just share something? Of course. Just the the yeshiva that this rabbi comes from, where I go to learn. So many times I see in yeshiva um, Haredi people that come and learn there, and that's really has their yeshiva. And I see I don't know if know these terms. What? Is there everyone familiar with oh, terms? Oh, it's like national religious, na- national religious, it's a national religious mm-hmm. that I believe in going to the army and combining Torah so learning. I see Haredim, which are, uh, we hear you call them the black hats, I guess, I don't know, coming to um, sit and try to um, see what this place is about, and I see non-religious people sitting over there. And they very quickly make comments that are, that, that are, it's far out from left field that, that, could get your blood boiling, but the way the rabbis and the students deal with it is it's with a lot of curiosity. No one is ever thinking that they want to impose their national religious view on what the Haredi or the or the non-religious person. And I find the discourse over there very um, respectful, interested, like um, even like wondering and questioning what the other person has to say, whether they agree with it or not. They just want to help the other person articulate his view. And that's, that's like their goal over there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is that a it, it, no, in any of the classes that I go to. In any class, that any rabbi in that yeshiva is giving it, of a that we're learning, that's, that's the way they interact with anyone that walks into the place. Is that the attraction for the Haredim that come? They're pretty blown away because they, at the beginning, come thinking that they're going to convince everyone that their way is right, and they're also curious. And no one is being convinced by them, but everyone is just interested to hear what they have to say. And it creates, it allows them to start listening to what the national religious are saying. Because everyone heard them out to the end. No one argues with them. Everyone's accepting them. We don't, like, like they're just curious to hear where they come from and what, what is happening with them. And that, with, once they, who that was like, once they get it all out, they're more able to listen to the, so, also, like in from Dreyfus's house, let's say he always used to. He's, a, he's the head of the yeshiva. Okay, he's the head of the yeshiva. So he used to describe his um, Shabbat table in um, when, when his kids were younger. Like his kids would come and they would say, "We think the Palestinians are being persecuted, and we shouldn't be blah blah." And they would have this like huge argument at the table, and as opposed to like as. You mean the, the other people would come and say that? No, his children would come to the table and say, we think the Palestinians are being persecuted. And it would create like a whole argument at the table and, and everyone was trying to prove that they're right. And when he changed his way of, let me just listen, he was it like arguments, like the meals just became so much more pleasant arguments because he wanted to hear what his kids have to say all the way through. And how do you think they're persecuted? And what makes you say that? And what, like, I want to get behind your belief, not in challenging, just curious. I want to know what you have to say. You as a person, you as an individual, your thoughts and feelings of who you are, and I really want to know who you are. And that's... The name of this is Shiva, which means dialogue. Mm. Right? So this is the end so, of the Shiva? Um, so this is Rav Shagab and Rav Dreyfus. Rav Shagab passed away about seven years ago, and Rav Dreyfus is running the Shiva now. This was the Yisha, and they created this kind of learning opportunity and space it's all different where it's right? open to everyone, and it's open to all approaches. Okay. In, the, in, the, in the Yeshiva, on the bookshelf, in the bookshelf you have everything from uh, academic study of Bible and, and Talmud to the, the most traditional Rishonim and Acharonim on the bookshelf. And everything is fair game, it's Hasidic and it's Mithrash, and it's, everything is part of the learning, it's a part of the Hashanah. Okay. Oh, Where's the misfura? Where's what? the system? Okay, I, I don't okay. want to get too much into the yeshiva now, but it's um, it's a good. Very what happens is the other when you're in the in the time when you're not talking, you're already thinking of the, what you're going to say in response to what they're saying. 
Uh, you hear him like the first hook, and then we throw it out. I got my response cards, and then boom, I got, I know what I'm going to say. Chess. Yeah. And uh, so it's very, very masculine, right? It's very, okay, he said that, I'm going to say that. And a lot of times this kind of dialogue can happen also in marriage between husband and wife, especially on an occasion where there's an argument, right? We're already answering that the other person is going to say, he said this, I know he's going with that, I know she's going with that, and I know you think of the answer already. There's one type of uh, an approach to, uh, to having quarrels in a couple, a couple, between couples, that before you say, and this also can happen in the classroom, before you can say, before you can respond, you have to repeat what you heard. So if you, let's say you're having a, a quarrel or an argument or a debate or whatever it is, and your husband says something, and yeah, you want to respond. But before you respond, you say, I heard you say this and this and this and this. Or, or I heard you say that and that. Is that correct? No, it's not, not precisely. And then you correct, and then you make sure that there's understanding, and then respond. Yeah, right. So this is dialogue. And in Siach, in the Shiva, they, they are going for that, for that approach. Uh, women's Torah. That's what I want to get to. Feminine style of learning Torah. And to do that, we have to look a little bit about... You now, we are living in Brooklyn for all, all these years. I feel like one of the biggest... Um, if you could see, uh, people were there. Uh, I, I, I missed out on some. That, that I did not even think of ever visiting the Lubavitcher Rebbe. It was like the furthest thing from... Uh, did anyone here ever visit the Lubavitcher Rebbe? You heard some? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Eastern Parkway, though? Eastern Parkway, yeah. yeah. You used to give it a dollar. I went once. You used to give it a dollar. So, so it's a tremendous, really, is one of, one of the great people of the previous generation or our generation. Mm-hmm. One of the great Jewish leaders. I mean, just, think, just think of the widespread of Chabad throughout the world. And I'm not a Chabad, you know, I'm not a card carrying Chabad guy. Uh, but you think of the tremendous work that this human being did. It's, it's unbelievable. And his love for people, and his influence on people all over the world. And now we're 20 years after his uh, passing, uh, and it's still the influence is still being felt. It's amazing. Just last year, the Yahweh in the UN quoted the Baba Chiraki when he, in his speech to the UN. He said, do you remember what he said? When he was first appointed ambassador to the UN, so the Baba Chiraki told him, this place is a place of darkness. And just know that it just takes one candle in a dark place to light it up. You be that candle. Tremendous. And he told, and he told it over. The influence uh, of his students and of his students' students and it's going on is a great move. Also, very forward thinking. He was very aware of the feminist movement that was coming to its very strong heyday in his time. In his time. And his response was very unexpectedly open-minded to it. In fact, he developed or articulated a theology which, which took the feminine move, the feminist movement and the increase in women's learning Torah as a sign of the redemption, the ultimate redemption. It's, um, till I prepared for this class, till I studied really the, the sources of Rav Shagal's things in, I wasn't aware of how much he, he was very in favor and very pushed, uh, very much encouraged women's learning Torah and opening all aspects of Torah to women. Talking about Lubavitch. Lubavitch, yeah. yeah. And uh, we're going to going to hear some things that are just uh, astounding when you hear them. It's, uh, and and Rav, Rav Shagav's basis of his feminine style Torah of the Torah of the redemption will be will be based on certain ideas found in uh, the Lubavitch Rebbe and in the Zohar, in the Kabbalah of the Ari. So yes. Practically speaking, we don't see we don't see a, a presence uh, a, a feminine presence in the Chabad. The the um, woman shlichot 
the, they, they have every year, uh, there are women, just like they send mission, not mission, how do you say, messengers and uh, agents of Chabad. So the women also take a very active role in that as well. It's not, the, the Lord Terry saw that the women had to, and there are women, he was first to have women mashfi'ot, uh, which means women who influence, and women are spiritual, spiritual influ- uh, influential women. And he gave them those titles, and he considered them not just the wives of the shlichim, but independent shlichot that are out there doing their own work in this society, uh, wherever, or wherever they were, they were sent to. Only so as, as wives. They no, were never not, sent independently, were they? They, they usually send married, you know, married groups anyway. Married, um, they're not, they don't, I don't think they send uh, individual uh, singles. Because they're the, the big concern. If you go with a family unit, you're more stable and more... If you go with single, a single, a single guy, single, so not neither single men nor single women go. Um, My surgeon was a woman, a partner, and he allowed her to sort of operate on men. The, 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 the Rebbe very much encouraged everyone to learn everything there is in the, to learn, right? anything, science, math, uh, law, legal, uh, Spirit alone, with spirit, after that happens ultimately, spirit is advanced beyond what is raising up of the material world, advances spirit beyond where it can reach without the combination of the physical world. So it's, Chabad very much believes that this world is to be made spiritual, to be uplifted, and it will uplift spirit itself. It's, take two things, break the spirit, the matter up the spirit, mm-hmm. and then the, the synergy is stronger than it would have been earlier. Okay, yes. So you're saying rather than favor an aesthetic model, that if you are in the world and you're bringing spirituality to the material, that is a preferred, that's preferable to isolating yourself from society and trying to attain spirituality to avoid any material Mm-hmm. That, that right. It's not like, a, let's say, a very Christian view, which says anything of the matter of the body is uh, bad. Yeah, that's, that's you know, uh, we try to keep away from mm-hmm. that, and we try to, you know, um, marriage and having children is just a uh, concession to, uh, you know, to, 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 to the karma, or to the what's forbidden. Wealth is uh, Wealth, right. And all these things, the material is something to be denied. The city of God, uh, you know, Augustine writes about the city of God being separate and apart and all spiritual. Um, the ideal is the monk who removes himself from the world, the monastic life. For us, for Jews, and especially for the Babits, but for Jews, all Jews, to do. this world, we're here in this world. Our major work is to work with this world. If God didn't, didn't want this world, he wouldn't have created it. God wants this world. He wants the, he wants the physical, and the Babits to raise the the physical up to the spiritual, world. and that takes the spiritual to understandings beyond what it could have reached otherwise. And mm-hmm. what about like the Torah? I'm from the Nazir, or not? Like I'm saying, like a Nazir is like completely removed from, like what you were saying, that Christianity, like a Nazir is like you know, like that. What right? is the Nazir removed from? Oh, you know this. I was saying the Torah. What's that? The material world. No. Oh, wine. 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 What else? What else, James? You know. <laughs> wine and 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 uh, a relationship. No. Oh, no. Three things. Wine, I know. Wine and great products. All right. Okay. Wine. Cutting in hair. Haircut. Yeah. Not enough. And the third one is coming into contact with the dead person. Oh. The Nazir, you want to be, you want to take things to its extreme? Okay, we got something. <laughs> <laughs> no one. <laughs> yeah, well, what about sex? You can have <laughs> What about uh, talking to people? You can talk to <laughs> No hair. <haircut. laughs> okay. And, and the people extreme. want to talk to you. No yeah. coming into contact with the dead body. So I want to do that anyway. <laughs> So Torah already is recognizing the desire of certain people to be more religious. Okay, you want to be, want to be more religious? Okay, no wine. 
What else? Could I play basketball? Yeah. <laughs> Everything is okay. It's, it's, it's already a tremendous step. The Torah, it's a tremendous chidush of the Torah to look at Nazir in this way, recognizing, let's say, an innate desire of wanting to be one up on everyone else. I'm going to show you more religious. And you have to do the sacrifice. And you're still a person. And you're almost like a Kohen. You're almost like a Kohen. You want to be a Nazir? Fine. We'll let you be more religious. This is the way you do it. But it even minimizes that. And even that, the Bili Ezer says, one of the korbanot that the Nazir brings is the korban chatat, the sin offering. What did he sin? God made certain things forbidden and certain things allowed. You denied more things than God denied you? <coughs> Bring a korban chatat. God didn't make this world for you to be, in the, to be an ascetic, to be self-denial. That's not what he does. That's a really it. And it's, a, it's a position in the Gemara. If it's pshat or not, I don't think it's pshat in the Pesukim, but... So, Nazir, we don't have that concept of Nazir, the monastic life, I mean, living the forest. But, but it's not meant for anything, like, does the Torah look down upon the Nazir or not? I don't know. The Torah, uh, according to rabbinic Judaism, yes. That there was a group in, mm. in Eretz Israel that had this type of monastic living. That had, it was only a male society. Yeah. And they, uh, had, they uh, kept high levels of uh, religious... Uh, Ritual purity. They had mikvahot, and they lived apart. They were called the Essenes. The Essenes. Dead Sea Scrolls. Some some of the stuff of the Essenes are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, let's. let's start. The goal is the combination of this world, the material world, and, and the spiritual world. And um, one concept of this combination. The Gemara, the, the, the Torah says in Bereshit, after it creates man and woman, Hashem blesses man and woman and says, what's that? Through Urvu, right? Be fruitful and multiply. Think about plural, through Urvu? Plural. Dominate the world. Okay. Milu et ha'aretz, fill the world, the kibshua, and dominate. Is the word kibshua singular or plural? Keep shu ha. They keep shu ha. Keep shu plural. Ota singular, right? They keep shu. So it's plural. Gemara says in Masechet Yilamot, it's derech ha'ish likvosh v'lo derech ha'isha likvosh. It's a man's characteristic to conquer, and not a woman's to conquer. So we have the plural. So the Lord is dealing with this question. Where is the plural? <laughs> and now we have to think about this. Yes. What happens is, and he explains that when, when the man and the woman are working in partnership, so then it's plural. And by the woman, by the man listening to the woman and taking, taking her into him in full partnership, it becomes together together to go to, the, to conquer or dominate the world. Now I'm gonna, we're going to make a switch. The world, the material world, the man is matter, right? man is part of the material world. So man can, is matter and matter. Only when man attempts to dominate is taken with, the, man needs something beyond the material world, like the Torah, right? So when man you and men learn Torah, they are, and the Torah becomes part of them, they can influence the world. Am Yisrael, men and women, who learn Torah, who are part of, who are connected to Torah, we have influenced the world. And together, the Torah is like this, the feminine side, the Ruach side, and then when a nation is infused with spirit of Torah, right, when a nation, let's say, a, a male, masculine, dominating kind of force, it takes the words of Torah, which is a spiritual, a more intuitive, prophetic kind of voice, it can influence the world. Uh, Am Yisrael amongst the nations. Am Yisrael amongst the nations. Take these ideas also. If the nations, a lot of nations, right, the nation has a sense of might makes right. 
Am Yisrael, the Zechora, are coming with right Mitzrayim. Now, right Mitzrayim is a very difficult thing to be in in the world. But the world, a lot, a lot of the world works with power politics in the world we live in now, where it's about the might and the power. And Am Yisrael is like the woman in the sense, all of them to the world. How powerful are we? How numerous are we? Not so much. So it's the view that just like Am Yisrael was hidden, but we have tremendous influence. Look at the, first of all, look at the religions that came out of, of, of Judaism, of Torah, that, that influenced a large part of the world to, to, to this day. America is very influenced by Protestantism and by the things found in the Torah. So when, when the man and the, and the woman come together, together, only and only together, can there be any type of uh, uh, influence. The, the, uh, the Rebbe, the, the Nebaracha Rebbe, believed very strongly that it was time, that we're living in a time where we, it's time to, for the women to make their voices heard and their learning to come out and to be part of, um, uh, part of the, what's happening in Torah. He writes, and this is a quote, <coughs> after thousands of years, after thousands of years of male dominance, we are at the, and he's writing this about 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we are at the right of the, at the cusp of the, the feminine period. When women will realize and understand their tremendous, their true importance, and the whole world will recognize the harmonia shaben haish veisha, what is the importance of the harmony between man and woman. So the Bible says we're entering of this kind of period where it's a woman after many, many thousand millennia of male dominance. We're entering a period where uh, the woman side, the feminine side, is going to be much more prominent, and we're going to, and it's going to provide a needed corrective to a male-dominated world. Yes? Um, but there's a lot of divorces, and the divorce rate is getting higher. Yeah. So they're not working together, they're working separate. Right. Um, right. When so is it going to shift to uh, working together? Uh, first of all, the uh, divorce rate, rate is rising. That's true. You men and women are less tolerant of working with each other. They'd rather get rid of the other person. Right, and that's, um, I think it says, first of all, somewhat more about women, that the divorce rate is rising. Not that it's to blame, you know, but it's, it's um, where in the past, and it says a lot about marriage and the respect of marriage in our days. Uh, oddly enough, or paradoxically, um, human beings, we expect more from marriage than where maybe in the past home would have come up with a, a difficult marriage. Now we know, we know that, okay, we work, we work, we work, we give it many years of time to work out and it doesn't work. So we want something more from that marriage. And if, the, if we work and we realize that it's not working, after many, many attempts, so I, I would still say, you know, we still work it if that's what we're given and that the divorce is only, uh, I, I mean, Torah allows for divorce, obviously, and it's, uh, it's because um, sometimes uh, a marriage with a lot of fighting and things is not good for the children. But really, we, divorce really doesn't solve a lot of the same problems that people have. So Hashem, I believe that Hashem gave us the matches that we have. Most of the time, we, we choose correctly, and it's a tikkun for us, both man and woman, to work things out together. And divorce is like... Uh, I don't want to give. I don't want to give a blanket statement. And many, I would expect. I would. Uh, first, my first suspicion would be that. Uh, yes. Now I remember why I said singular, because the, with the, but the, the hamim uh, pick up on the word chivshura is chaser chaser So it's in, in the. They make that the They make the rasha where the pirul uh, vu is with. You know, with the Yes. Yeshua says it's singular. 
Right. So it has right. that um, that double uh, that double uh, play. That's right. That's right. That's and of right. course, uh, uh, the Rav would, would base his whole Gedasha on this Adam one and Adam two, uh, mm -hmm. focusing more on the, uh, the I guess the dual nature the dual nature of all mankind, mm -hmm. not just not, not just split. Men. Right. Not split along the male female line, right? But in all of us, that we have uh, the desire to uh, conquer, to conquer, and to understand, and to and, and to, to try and grasp what's going on in, in our world, and to do things, and to build. And on the other hand, we have um, this other uh, emotion or this other being that we're that we're nothing, that we're in this. Uh, a part in this vast universe. So. Right. So, and the Hachim do say, they do make a derasha, and it's, it's the man's, uh, the man's nature to conquer based on the fact that there's no love. And the the the, the Rebbe is saying, it's both, it's still plural, because the woman and the man together, uh, mm -hmm. are only, only when the woman and the man are working together, Fine. can it work. But could, could you um, extrapolate, I'm sure, I'm sure you can, uh, within the individual, we have, like, we're, we, we are, as you started out, we um, are stereotyping and dividing male-female, but uh, we have to allow for the possibilities, and the endless possibilities of male and female in each one of us, and maybe the role then would be to, um, to try and blend these, or, or Synthesize these uh, these capabilities uh, within ourselves. Okay. Uh, as a model. Yes, there are there are in everyone these tendencies, and uh, we know even biochemically, hormonally, there's male and female hormones in, in everyone, uh, whether man or, or a woman. And it's um, what the point that we're saying is, yeah, that there's we should give uh, some understanding, more understanding, to the parts of us that are. Uh, that are either male or female, depending on the opposite, the opposite parts of us. Uh, I want to give an example is that of how, when we're talking about um, a male and female way of learning, uh, or a class, or I don't know if anyone ever went to a Bet Midrash that was in full tilt. Anyone ever see hair the, the uh, tumult? Of a baby dash in full swing. Yeah. Okay, well, how would you describe uh, what goes on there? Exciting. Exciting. Uh, Energetic. What's that? Energetic. Energetic. Okay. Argumentative. Cacophonous. Cacophonous. Passionate. Passionate. What you're learning about, they're very. Right. Awesome. I don't see, like, people almost come. I mean, to blow, but they don't because they're not going to go that far. But they're so, such so passionately presenting their point of view, they're shouting. If you saw, uh, someone told me, I, I was learning in the in the Beale synagogue today, and next to me there was a, two a chavruta. I was learning with Joe Kippen, and next to me was a chavruta, and they were yelling at each other and very loud, very loud. So. One of the, the rabbis that was learning in the next uh, announced table said, one time we were learning, um, so the non-Jewish help saw the, the, us learning, and he was wondering, well, we're we going to start hitting each other. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, even the, the Hakamim, the Gemara speaks about the, the people who would come learn in the academies there as the Baalea Tvisim, those who hold the shields and the swords. So they, they saw that Milchamta Shel Torah, they're fighting the battle of Torah. Very kind of, if you have to say masculine or feminine, very masculine type of involvement. What a feminine kind of involvement. So yeah, again, to generalize, I mean, what a feminine kind of learning. Maybe doing more listening than more proving your point. I would imagine even more arguing. Mm -hmm. More arguing. More emotional. Mm -hmm. 
learn in the Lego with Frank film? Like, what, what, what's the format? Are they different formats? Or? No, they, 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 they teach in colorful classes, and, and um, it's like they would teach anything. By, by lecture? By lecture. But they, but there's more of um, questions and answers. Is that up and down? I think it's the same as it would be in the men's class. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that necessarily that all women have learned this way, all men learn that way. But if I, if you had to say different types of classes that you go to, right? What would using the really the um, characteristics that we spoke about before, the general, let's say a masculine kind of class and a feminine kind of class, right? Masculine kind of class would be. What would be the nature of it? More dictatorial. More? Dictatorial. Dictatorial, authoritarian. Someone put up there? Like brass tacks. Brass tacks. Yeah. Yeah. Nuts and bolts. Okay. Uh, maybe it's very unidirectional. You know, a lot coming from the authority figure. Yes. One of I learned with uh, Asinari, um, their sister, she's very engaging in the whole group, and she has a big group. She's always like reaching out to, the, to her, you know, students and like trying to bring them into the conversation. She's not like projecting onto them as much as she's trying to always engage them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, there. This is the type of learning, the type of learning of appreciating of other opinions and other ideas and being able to hold different ideas together. Uh, that. Uh, the Lubavitcher should be talking about. And when asked the question, why now? Why does it happen in our day? Like, why are we so far away from the, the giving of the Torah? Lubavitcher has a very interesting answer to this. He says, we are far away from the giving of the Torah, we were closer to the time of, of the redemption, closer to the time of Geulah. And he says it's, it's a, necessary, um, a necessary thing that's going on, that's happening in the world because as we're approaching redemption, this approach to learning Torah has to be brought out and emphasized. Uh, it is the it, it's a taste of what's to come, it's a taste of what's to come, of the appreciating of other opinions. Uh, it's a taste of the good. It's necessary, and it's really what redemption is going to be like. Is it going to hasten the redemption? Is it going to bring it on, or it's post? The more he saw, the more and more women get involved and bring their unique voice and their unique approach and their personality, their in inborn or natural characteristics to learning, that is going to add something not only number wise of having more people, but also a qualitative difference of the Torah that will be learned. A more, uh, a more compassionate Torah, a more understanding Torah, one that, that tries to look at different opinions. In, in ways that are that are um, more receptive, not aggressively trying to beat one another. Now, the basis of that already is found in the Talmud. Uh, last week we spoke about Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai. Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, or no, not in this class, I spoke in this class. If the Gemara Masechet Erubim says that Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai argued about different things for 13 years. 13 years they were arguing until a dark call came out and said, uh, These and these are the words of the living God, and the halacha is like Betila. So now you have the idea of these and these. Right? How can Hashem say this and that? Uh, and why then decide halacha like Betila? Well, this and that because. Another Gemara says, once there was a machloket on one particular issue of Tumar Tahara uh, as impurity, and it happened that a person met Eliyahu and Avi, and he was brought, brought to heaven. And now he has the opportunity to be in heaven, and he asked his question, okay, now I'm here in heaven, what is the halakha on this point? And Eliyahu and Avi told him, well, some of the Malachim say this way, and some say that way. <laughs> I thought it was going to be uh, decided then. In other words, that it's a very postmodern way, you know, very allowing for both things to coexist. Now, the Gemara will be back to this. Why is Allah like Beit Hillel? Because they were. Respectful. 
They were anavim. They were humble, and they learned their own opinion and Bet Shammai's opinion. And not only that, they put Bet Shammai's opinion first. Now, why is humility the reason? Right? Why is humility one of the reasons why their halacha was chosen in their faith? They listen to the other opinion. They listen to the other opinion. But yet, when you're, when you're, when you're very uh, egotistical, you're not listening to the other person's part. And therefore, you're not going to really come at an understanding. A true understanding of So that humility, and that they learn the Shammai's opinion also, means that they're open to hearing other parts. A woman's way of learning, in this view, and what Shagav is talking about, is one that doesn't have to come to, that can realize the possibility of various truths and various correct ways in the world. Uh, and that is the type of learning that happens in the yeshiva, the type of learning that, um, that will be, according to Shagav, the learning of the future and the learning of the redemption, learning of the of redemption. Application. Certain applications. Uh, I want to give a couple of uh, maybe four or five applications to this idea. One, in the family. In the family between husband and wife. And we spoke a little bit about that. Uh, so can anyone think of how that would work in the family? Take these ideas of not run one right way, but multiple right ways. How would that work in a family, in a husband-wife situation? Modeling, modeling for the children. Leaving the children out. Okay. Really trying to understand what you, what your, what your uh, spouse is, is thinking and feeling, and re- really being one. Try, trying Does to. Does it mean always agree? No, but understanding and listening to what they have to say, uh, and not uh, not not to feel that you're that's only your world. So you know, you're, you're in your world, and everyone else is uh, is there just for you. Uh, but rather, you have to really treat the other person as a, as a as a real partner. Partner and appreciating that alternative perspective on the world and on reality, appreciating to the point where, almost to the point where you have to say, well, that might be right. I have to consider that that way as well. And look at the what I thought I was so correct. I want to consider it from my spouse's point of view. Now, but you can take a stand so this way or that way. And when it's true, you're not going to have two truths. You have to. He's saying you have it. At the end, at the end, sometimes there has to be an either or decision. Usually, if done correctly, um, and a lot of it with a lot of understanding, sometimes we can arrive at a consensus position that achieves what both parties want. Now, um, I have an example. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, I teach uh, marriage classes, so very often you'll see an Ashkenaz woman marrying a Sephardic man or vice versa, and it's very respectful when a couple can say, you know, between themselves, you know, if you choose to take on the customs of the family, I respect that, but the husband says that to the wife, I don't expect you to sit seven times, you don't have to, if the tradition of your family is one or three or whatever it is, it doesn't have to be one person dictating to the other be a mutual understanding between us where I'd like to keep this tradition, very nice, I respect that. It's not what my family does, and you make a change. Okay, I'd like to give everyone a tool to use, and it's sort of a, it's a mental tool to, to help get out of these quandaries where it's one way or the other way, right? And, and I want everyone to learn to distinguish between position and need. Very often these things get confused. And we say, I need A, B, and C, and therefore this is what we're going to do. But we don't say I need A, B, and C, we say this is what we're going to do. And the other party thinks to themselves, 
no, we're doing this. And those are positions, those are stated positions. When we're in a situation where well, either we're going to the, uh, you know, we're going to deal this weekend or we're going to stay in uh, Brooklyn. We're going to live in Israel or in the States? I don't think that applies to many couples. Is that a position or a need? So, living in Israel, living in the States, is a position. Could I vote? I'd rather you live here and go away here, and then when we move, you can move. Okay. If you had a vote in our family, we would be <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's take that one. Mm. Or, should we go watch a movie or play travel together? Okay. It's <laughs> so that's a position, right? It's seemingly, it's seemingly, it's one or the other. Right? It's one or the other. So now, how do you move? And please, everyone think of one of those, one of the other things that you have in your family, right? Think of a big one. No, we're not going to ask you to say it. It's not we like just that. say little ones, and then ask them. You can say little ones also oh. if you want. But <laughs> so now, when we when we work on this, and I work on this, <laughs> so okay, what do I need? Why would I want to be in this community? Now, we almost, if I could be personal and tell. Yeah. <laughs> 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 when, when we were engaged, uh, when we were engaged. Um, and I went to Israel, I hadn't met my future mother-in-law yet, and she hadn't met me, and so I went to Israel to meet my future mother-in-law, and there was like a kind of family gathering and friends, and the, everyone knew that the Israel-America issue was going to come up in our marriage, and a friend who had just divorced the husband who was to move to Israel told my future mother-in-law, not going to work. There's no way that they're going to be married. Mm-hmm. It's better they break up now than after they have children. I'm living through it and it's hell. And my future mother had other reasons for wanting us to break up. <laughs> <laughs> also connected to the fact that she was worried that Michal might end up living in her own. And I told Michal, and he said, we don't know how we're going to resolve this issue. We don't know how we're going to resolve it, but we're going to resolve it in a way that's unique. Looking back at what, how we resolved it, it's like we lived a lot in America. We came for the last 20 years of the Aliyah, came every summer for two months. And I had a need, all my needs. My needs were to be involved in my community, to be connected to my family, and to be able to teach in the community. Um, at one point, the summers were not enough for me, and I, we decided, I decided to, that I had a need to be living in the community, working full time, and that's when I came to Hillel. Uh, and looking back at that, this is, we could not, there's no way we could have figured this out before while we were engaged. But we lived our lives saying, okay, what do, what do we need now? I need this, we need that. And instead of just deciding, we were flexible about certain other things, and we met and were meeting each other's needs without uh, deciding once and for all where it's going to be. And this can be done in a lot of different examples, a lot of different ways, where you don't focus on the position, America or Israel, you focus on what are the needs, and how is there a third possibility that allows everyone to achieve the needs that they have? So now this gets to think of well, what's true. Um, what's truth between Bethel and Bet Shalom? What's truth between, between let's say, in our community, the Haredi way and the uh, uh, religious nationalist modern orthodox way? Right? What's truth? And taking, let's say, a more feminine or postmodern view of it is to say, you know what, there's truth in each of the places. 
Now, not to be that I have to agree wholeheartedly with everything that goes on in the Haredi world, but are there things that I can learn from it? Are things I want to learn? Yes. And it's that type of allowing for different opinions to exist, to coexist, wanting to understand different opinions, and and taking it a step further, saying that Hashem put me in contact and us in contact with the different opinions is part of our tikkun, part of our means of improving ourselves. Just like our spouses. Hashem gave us each of our spouses tailor-made to improve ourselves, to help us improve. And I say it in both directions. We're both as of can go for both. It goes both ways. Right? And it's great when things are harmonious and there's no quarrel, and the improvement is even better when there's a quarrel. Because that's the, that's really where the rough edges are, and when we see, we have work to do. So when things are going harmoniously and there's no quarrel, and that's, they're chugging along great. But we hit a bump, and uh, we have a very strong difference of opinion, or even stronger than a different difference of opinion, that's the point we have to work on and understand different sides, understand how we're supposed to correct ourselves, um, how we're supposed to improve and grow from that difference of opinion. When I meet a person who disagrees with me completely, 180 degrees, and not only in a marital situation, but say anywhere, so wow, I'm so happy that Hashem put me in contact with this person. Because now I'm going to see the other side, the other perspective, in such a way that will allow me to deepen my understanding. And that's yeah, on that note, um, I go to all different classes. I'll go to black hat classes, I'll go to white hat classes, I'll go to modern classes, I'll go to college hat classes, I'll listen to TED Talks. I, I just listen to, to, because that way, it's funny because when I go to Allegra, it's a rabbi, like I'm more, I lean more Ramban, and he's very Ramban. And, and when I come into the class and he's talking the things, he goes, you know, I like when you're in the class, even though you never agree with me, because you balance my opinion. You, you, you make me see the other side, and I realize that there's two sides. I even got one of the Allegra teachers to read um, Yakut Maharan. I gave him the book, <laughs> <laughs> Maharan, because I said, you know, I think you, know, you only see this way. There is another way of thinking, and I brought him the book, and um, I never got to discuss it with him because the, the, the semester ended. But because, you know, you know, even my husband sees more one way, and because I was going, in, the other's mostly black hat classes, so I would be going to more of those classes. That's why I signed up for a level, because I said I wanted to balance that way. I could understand him, his opinions, and I could, but I, I could also, you know, balance mine and see that there's two sides. So I guess I live Shammai and Hillel. <laughs> I think it's important not to only go because that way you, you have more tolerance because you see that like I get people that say oh that rabbi thinks he's so black and he and he only says this and but it's not true because if you sit in his class you see that he says other things and he you know unless you're actually in the classes and see them he, people only hear like little parts but I, I see them as a whole mm -hmm. so thank, you, thank you for that it's very, it's very critical and it's a, a very uh, a model to be emulated um, I just want, the one thing you said bothered me. Okay. I just want to deepen a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I don't like the word tolerance. I don't it's like the word tolerance. I don't like it. Oh, I don't know if I use the right word. <laughs> Why don't you like it? Explain. Why? Except is a better word. Define it. Um, understanding, maybe. Maybe I should use the word understanding. People couldn't understand other people's ways. Uh, I would. I would. Uh, use the word more of uh, appreciating differences right. and being enriched by them. Tol toler tolerance implies, you know, I'm right. I'll stand it. I'm, I'm right. Well, I'll put up with you. <laughs> right. No, I mean, that's a better word. I didn't mean it that way. Yeah, I, I, but I wanted to bring that right. point up. So it's really when, when I go to a class and I sit in class with Saturday, I go every morning with uh, a rabbi, love the class. He's coming from a very different worldview than me, uh, than I am. I mean, at home, I love him. Right? But it's a different worldview, it's different. And I get so much out of it. Um, I don't agree with him on everything, but I appreciate where he's coming from. I also, I'm enriched by it. So let's, let's um, move to understanding. Okay, that's husband's wife, community thing. 
um, raising children. Does anyone here have teenage children? Okay. okay. So how can this idea of, of uh, I'm not talking about 13, 14, I'm talking about 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 age, right? What's that? No, even 13, 14. Even 13, 14. Uh, how can this idea of, let's say, postmodernism or uh, understanding or multiple truth be applied in raising our teenage children? My child is standing there like, yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't know if you have any idea. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Maybe you have to ask your child. Yeah. Yeah. What would you want? How would you raise your kids? I would think that, like, your, your kids, to a degree, are, are going to sort of be like, not a, a mirror image of you, but sort of like, um, like if you go to a fun house, you know, and you see like a mirror, they're going to be like you, but they're going to be different in some ways, not like grotesque necessarily, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, like, there's going to be some things about them that you find very similar and some things that you find very different. And I think that it, it comes in like understanding the differences and, and hearing both sides talk about the differences and not tolerating the differences because not one side is not necessarily right, but just un like understanding the other side's the, what the other side has to say and, and not like invalidating what the person has to say. You know, you know, it's okay, it's okay to feel that way, it's okay to think that. And I mean, I don't know how that comes into into conversation with parenting if the kid wants to go and do something reckless and says, Oh, this is what I think. Right? I mean at some point as a parent you have to say this is wrong. So that's why I'm supposed to get to them now. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, parents we all know already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So, anyone else want to? Uh, sometimes our kids do something, things that are not that they're self-destructive. You know, they'll put the line of self-destruction. But let's say decisions that are just so out of what we would want them to do. This is not the way I talk to you. This is not what I want you to do. And this is well, what are you doing? Now, so if I put the line of things that are self-destructive, that's very clear. It's, 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 children are more risk-taking than parents. Oh, yeah. And they take risks that we feel are unnecessary. Skydiving. Mm -hmm. It's unnecessary it's risk. Mm -hmm. And yet, kids do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, right, right. So, so, or other types of exploring and experimenting. Right? Uh, not, I'm not talking about, uh, let's say, people children might decide they want to go to college and then leave college or go in this major and that major or then they decide to do this business or that business. That's all doing body piercing. What's that? That's doing body piercing. Yeah. Well, and oh, creating... Yeah. Abitronic <laughs> and, and to a certain degree, to a certain degree, and with limits of course, but there has to be, you know, okay, this is what my child is wanting to explore. Again, putting the line in self-destructive <laughs> behavior. My child wants to explore. Uh, it's not where I want them to be. It's not the way I would want them to grow up. Uh, but it's part of my understanding of what they are as young people, finding their way in life. And it's their way. And I can express my opinion. I can impose my opinion. Right? What age uh, can you express and not impose? Or is that always? No, 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 it's not always. Like Once again, I'm thinking about 18, 18 to 25, <laughs> 18, you know, over 18, there's more, 18, 19, 20, you start to allow for more, I mean, my, my, my opinion, right, allow for more um, exploring and expressing, it's still expressing my opinion, but after that, there's no imposing anymore. It's 20, 21, 22. Can you still express your opinion, even though you know that they're not going to? With you, and then they, and they, you know, they're not going to agree with you if you tell them you shouldn't jump off that cliff or something on the skiing. Just giving you an example. So telling them that they shouldn't, you're making them disobey you, and then they're sending to their. So should you not tell them, or is it 
Harry is right. So there's no, there's no mitzvah of no? Obey your parents. No. No. You don't have to obey them? No. Do you have to listen to them? No. No. There's no mitzvah. Thanks, Rabbi. There's no mitzvah of Obey your parents. Next year's invitation. There's no mitzvah. Okay, the prime example, you want to get married to someone and your parents very strongly disagree. Uh, so you have to obey your parents when they say, don't marry that person? No. No. It's your parents, your life. And therefore, it's something that... So obeying parents is not a good sign. It's, in fact, even according to the way the Hachalim understand it, respecting parents is not a good sign. Showing respect to parents is a good sign. Acting respectfully to parents is a mitzvah. Respecting parents? How can I respect that? Right? You know, there's some families, not mine, some families where there is abuse. There's physical abuse, verbal abuse, many years, all growing up. Can I respect? No. Must I show respect? Yes. Have a distinction? So obeying is not, it's a common misunderstanding usually pro- proffered by parents that they, <laughs> the children have to obey their parents. It's not true. It's not the mitzvah. And even further, it's not even about to respect, it's to show respect, to act respectfully. So if you tell your child, you can't, uh, you can't uh, leave the house wearing that or something, and they start, okay, I'm, I'm still wearing that. They, they what age? 16, 17. They just said, you know, I don't have, I like this style, and I'm going to wear it, I'm going to walk out of that. Are they allowed to do that? Do you have to punish them? No. Punish, punish <laughs> is not going to work. Gonna I'm happen. just saying, do you have to, like, set limits, or? You, you, you should always, you should express your opinion, uh, especially as far as what time they should be home. That's, that's uh, 16, 17, you're home by 1130. Right? But you know they're coming home at 1. Okay? They're going to work. But if you didn't say 11.30, you don't know what time it'll be. So it's, it's good to set those time limits for our 16, 17 year olds and to express an opinion about you know, the dress clothes they're wearing. Uh, or even with younger kids. You know, it's freezing out and they want to go out in short sleep. Does that ever happen to anyone? Okay. What do you do? What about wearing helmets? Bicycles? Wait, Michal, what do you say to do in that situation? What? No. That's I feel like there's, there's something crucial and major that you didn't talk about, and that is to have faith and to have faith in your children and to have trust in them and to let them know that you have faith and trust in them and not to have that attitude of all the time, you know, we already experienced everything and we know everything and we know, but like there's a core of faith and trust that we need to have, that they need to internalize, and once they do, they're going to have faith and trust in themselves. Which is why it has to be a time 11:30. No, you sit down together, you talk. I trust you. I want to hear from you. What What are your needs? What are my needs? Like, there's no. I, I don't know. Even the whole thing with the limits is like, where is the first basic standard tr- trust and faith that you have in your child that they know it? And once they know it, then you have that. That's it. You have that. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Very good. When they're married. Uh, Wait. Yes, you know. Um, I, since like I'm 18, so I guess I'm on both sides of this. Um, like she was saying, uh-huh. how like what do you do when you you express your opinion to your children? They don't answer. They don't. They disregard. What if it's the opposite? Like the child is expressing like an opinion or a nice a thought or a feeling or anything because like kids are demanding, you know, whatever to the parent, but the parent is like. Sure, 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 but doesn't like internalize it or doesn't just think like, oh, well, I'm parent, so I'm better. Like, I'm parent, so like, whatever, I, I know what I'm doing is right. But like, yes, parents are usually more right than kids, but sometimes it's not necessarily true. If you have a kid that's like 24 or a kid that's 16, maybe even, or whatever, sometimes um, if the child expresses their opinion, and not like about how your parents dress, like as a parent can be to a child, 
but just about anything, like how they feel or a situation or something going on at home with other siblings. Um, how do you, how do, you, how does like a child and a parent create that balance if the parent doesn't doesn't reciprocate? Well, the parent's not really listening. Right, because a lot of times, like you see in movies or just classic family situations where a parent is like, well, I'm parent, so I'm right, so whatever you say, I don't really need to internalize because I can really just, I make my words law. So, so how do you bring about when another person's not listening? And it could be parent child, it could be not really deeply listening to you. How do you bring about deep listening? Right, is that, can you say yeah. that way? Eric? That's easy for me. Why answer? Are you parents answer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Eric. No, you have a question? <laughs> Irrespective of her question, but I think it's very important. But addressing her question. Right, right. Uh, in Irrespective of our personal family situation. Exactly. I'm not necessarily talking about Right, right. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. You know, I think, I think it's very important with, with kids, although my kids are younger than you, is not to talk above them or down to them, is to bring yourself down to their level, not necessarily to lower level, but on the, on the same path, and just talk more as a friend, and more that you're implying you understand them due to your experience. Like what I tell my kids, if my kid says something, I'm gonna do this, then look, you can do whatever you want, but let me just tell you my experience. When I was your age and I told my father, the same scenario, but my father responded to me. And now as a parent, I see that my father was right, but when I, when I was your age, I said he doesn't know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. So you can decide, meaning my, my son or daughter, you can decide to do whatever you want, but this is my opinion, I grasp it, acknowledge it, and if, once again, if they go astray, they may learn that, you know, maybe my parents said that something was right. But I think it's more important to talk on an equal level. Okay, thank you for that. Very important. And, uh, uh, how do we bring someone to listen to us that's not listening to us? Uh, and, or and it happens a lot of times in situations, in the hierarchical situations in a company. You have the boss and the, uh, the worker, and, how does, and the worker has opinions. And, uh, how do we get that across? Ms. Lutz, you want to address that question? Yeah, sometimes I refer to my family as like the team, like we're on the team together. So. If we need to help someone with something, like we're going to help this person out, like whether it's, you know, they're trying to study for a test, and they need someone to help them, or someone needs help with something, and we're going to help them. So we say, like, okay, tonight this person needs us to, you know, help them with something, and we're going to try to help, like, call it, like, we're, we're the team here, so. Mm -hmm. We're creating that culture in the family. And I say, it's not because I'm saying, it's because, like, this is what we have to do. We, you know, this person needs us, or that one, or daddy, or mommy, or someone needs something, so we're just going to. One of the uh, so one of the characteristics of Israeli society that's mentioned in the book Star of Nations uh, is that it's very non-hierarchical. Even in the army, it's, it's, the, the, the private can tell the general this stuff's not going to work. It's just it's wrong, and then the general takes that into consideration. But how do we get that culture to be built in, that, in a situation where there's a party that's not listening? It's, it's not easy, it's not easy, and it has to do with um, sometimes a, a person is afraid that you're not understanding them. So one one way of doing it might be to say, yes, I understand you saying this and this, and I, I want to express to you my problem with what you said. Uh, if you'd like to hear that, would you like to hear that? Yeah, and then first show an understanding, and then move to where you're not an acceptance, but an understanding. That's what a person could do. In a situation where, uh, you know, I have above in my I'm a principal of a school, so I have a supervisor, and the supervisor it's a hierarchical situation, and he says to all the principals, you have to do this, this, and that. Right? So now he's my supervisor. And he's the kind of person that I know that if I tell him, yes, you want us to do this, but my school has this and this problem, and I'm not going to do that work for my school. And then he, we have a culture of understanding where he says, yeah, I know your school, and but it's, it's developing that if I say I understand what you want, and it's a great idea for the system, no, it doesn't work for my school. And 
So it's getting that, that point of understanding and then we find it. We, Rav Shagar is talking about a feminine kind of learning of Torah, a feminine style. It fits very well with some of the things found in the postmodern society and in what's found in certain sections of the Talmud. Uh, the Midrash, for example, it's wonderful. You have an Anif Asuk, Davar Asher, Davar Asher, another understanding, another understanding. And never does it say which one is right. No, it's, it's, it's another, another understanding. So it's something that's found already in Judaism and in Torah and in our Talmud, and our sources already are speaking in so many, so many various ways of, of being together and taking <coughs> multiple approaches to some problem. Look at the Tanakh, for example. Tanakh is so many, so varied in its approach and so varied in its styles of writing that are in it. Even in the Chumash itself, you see, there are various different, sometimes conflicting strains within the Chumash itself. So we're about, that's what we already are. So learning Torah uh, in a way which values other opinions and listens deeply and also raises the question of what's the relevant stuff. How do we respond to this section of Gemara or this section? What is our emotional response to it? What is it where does it hit us on a Nishama level? We tonight we didn't explore tonight, but this is and not necessarily trying to say, well, which one is the right way? Who is the halakha? Who is the, no. What is the value of all the opinions that we see? Uh, this is somewhat of the nature of the, the Torah, the feminine style, the Mubarak Shagat is referring to a feminine way of learning Torah. This is what he means. It doesn't mean that only women can do it and only men can do it. It's a, he sees it as the Torah of the redemption, of the Geulah, and it's um, a Torah that shows greater understanding through difference of opinion. Now, you a song where in the period of uh, think the nine days of Tisha B'Av, almost coming up, and I believe that when we are able to really and truly take this appreciation of difference, of our other opinions, this sensitivity to one another's opinions, and make it part of our community and our families and our life, uh, it'll bring a, a stronger bond between us and the God Hashem, the Gula, will be soon come. Okay. We have 10 minutes, we have a second.